Um, so today I'm going to be talking about organ don donation and brain death. Uh, there was a podcast that we released a couple days on this, um, but I think uh, mine's going to be distinct in a couple of ways. The first is it's going to more broadly talk about organ donation and then embed the discussion on brain death within that context. So that'll be different. And then the second is that my approach to brain death is going to be a little bit more systematic and hopefully not only determine maybe what we should believe and how we should think about it, but why we should um, think those things as well. So that's what the presentation will be on. We can go ahead and start with the recognition that organ donation is everywhere. The point of showing that video was not because it's comical, but because it is topical, although the funny part does help. And what it shows is that organ donation is not only everywhere, but it's pretty universally accepted. And not only accepted, but thought of as a sacrificial, unalloyed good. So just by pausing and thinking deeply about the issues today, we're already swimming countercultural, and if we come to any nonconformist conclusions, then um, we're going that swimming is going to have to be amplified because um, you think our position on abortion runs countercultural. Any sort of position that says organ donation maybe isn't the greatest thing, or brain death has some issues, perhaps, is even more um, of a problem. But I want to start with just an overview of organ donation within the United States. So in 2021, there were over 40,000 transplantations in the United States, but over 100,000 people on the waiting list, which means there is a surplus of um, people needing organs. So there's a drastic scarcity of organs within this country. And that means many people are dying while waiting for organs that can save their lives. And many people believe this is a public health crisis in the United States and across the world. Um, Two-thirds of actual organ donors are deceased donors, and the other third, of course, will have to be living donors. And we're talking about donations of vital organs, so that includes the kidneys, the liver, heart, lungs, pancreas, for instance. Uh, the kidneys and liver are emboldened and have the asterisk um, because kidneys and liver can come from uh, a dead or living donor. And one final point I want to make here is that donors are not compensated. From their perspective, this is a purely altruistic enterprise. That's not necessarily the case for the healthcare industry, but it is for the donors, even though organs are incredibly valuable and expensive um, because it's a human body part that's scarce that can save someone else's life. And what we see is in actual other countries that have non-existent or woeful regulations of organ donation, uh, vulnerable people end up selling their organs for money, and they're exploited in those countries and abused. And it shows that we don't really need or we should not have a laissez-faire approach to this. There's a reason why um, th this uh, process from the donor's perspective is purely altruistic and good-hearted. So we can think about the actual process. So this is what it, organ donation looks like when the donor is deceased from both the recipient and the donor's perspective. So the recipient um, is in need of an organ because of some sort of illness or injury that has devastated an organ. And so that candidate is then evaluated for transplant compatibility by clinical metrics. And then based on those clinical metrics, that candidate is placed somewhere on the waiting list nationwide. And then the candidate is matched with organs by stuff like blood type, body size, waiting time, prognosis, and distance to, to a donor. For instance, it's much easier to get an organ from Houston to Dallas than it is from New York City to Los Angeles. So stuff like that is taken into account. And if the um, patient is lucky, he or she will receive a transplant um, because there's um, vastly more people waiting for organs than there are actual organs. Um, most people don't receive a transplant, sadly. And then the donor's end of things, um, the donor first arrives at the hospital with a catastrophic brain injury. So that can come in one of two forms. It can be traumatic or anoxic. So when you think about a traumatic brain, brain injury, think blunt force trauma, like a car accident. An anoxic brain injury would be your 
being deprived of oxygenated blood in the brain for a certain amount of time. Um, think someone drowning or, or suffocating on food. And then when that patient arrives at the hospital and it potentially can progress into brain death, or maybe the hospital and medical team already believes is brain dead and they are a potential donor, a local organ procurement organization is notified. So these are regional um, OPOs that cover different geographic areas. The hospital will notify the OPO in that area. And then the patient will be declared dead. Normally, the patient's declared brain dead in this process, and the OPO swoops in and harvests the organs. Until that point, the OPO is supposed to stay out of the medical decision-making process. Um, to ensure that all care for the patient until that point is for the patient's good. Is that always done? I think there are reasons to think no. In fact, the, the OPO could perhaps put pressure on the care team um, to give the patient subpar care. And then after the OPO harvest organs, the body is recovered by the family, um, the, the organ body, and then the organs are then transplanted into one or more patients. So that's dead organ donation in the process. Let's talk about a live donor organ donation for just a bit here. This is the procurement of paired organs from a healthy living donor. Um, paired is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, for instance, we do have paired kidneys, but we do not have a paired liver. What it means is we have excess of a given organ. Um, we have more uh, liver than we actually need, and the liver is able to regenerate itself. So we can theoretically and do often take part of a liver and transplant it into another patient. Kidneys, of course, because we have two and we technically only need one. And rarely you can take parts of a pancreas, lung, or intestines, but that's exceedingly rare um, compared to kidneys and a liver. When you think of live organ donation, just think kidneys and liver, because that's pretty much what happens in practice. There were 65, um, uh, 6,500 basically organs donated um, from living donors in 2021. And these donations typically take place between family members and perhaps friends who are of the same match. There's a reason why you don't have people lining up at hospitals to randomly give away a kidney or a liver. But if their loved one needs a kidney or a liver, they're, they're much more likely to donate an organ. And one of the benefits of live organ donation is that it's unmoored from disputes around death. So death as a concept is constantly debated. It's vociferously contested by philosophers and academics, and they have reached no consensus, and we're going to dive into some of that debate in a bit. But what's good about live organ donation, it has nothing to do with that. It's a completely separate topic, and that means it's free of those potential ethical dilemmas. But it has its own ethical complication, and if you think about live organ donation, you're literally carving into someone's healthy body and taking away their healthy organ for someone else's good. And as Christians and as human beings, we're supposed to respect our bodies, be caretakers of our bodies. Yet, this is a healthy person and it seems like we're disrespecting their bodies. But fortunately, some theologians, philosophers have thought of this problem and have come up with adequate solutions. So let's talk about that philosophical grounding for just a second. I think the most important principles here are the principles of integrity and totality. So the principle of integrity is the idea that we should respect the physical structure and capacities of the body. So we, we have a physical body. It is capable of doing certain things. We should not take that away willy-nilly. And then there's a sister principle um, called the principle of totality which recognizes that the parts of our body are ordered to the whole. My arm, my leg, my pancreas, my liver, they exist for the flourishing and functioning of my entire body, not just for themselves. So if they become diseased and pose a threat to my body, it is illicit to take it away because they're no longer serving the good of the whole. But it's not that simple when applied to live organ donation because in that case, these are healthy organs. They don't pose a threat to the body in the same way a diseased organ does. In fact, we're taking away this entirely healthy organ for someone else's good. And there's a concern that we're treating the patient not as, a, a, in that case, we're treating the patient not as an ends, as we always should, but as a means. 
Um, so some philosophers have thought about this problem, um, and here are just a few reasons. I'm not going to say one's better than the other, but there are a few uh, justifications that they provide. The first comes from Martin Dolan, and he basically says what, we, what it does is it extends the principle of totality. And the idea is that the parts of the body don't just serve the physical good of the patient, but the holistic good, including the spiritual good. And so when we donate an organ to someone else, um, for someone else's good out of this sacrificial love, and so doing, we're serving our own spiritual good as human beings. Gerald Kelly disagreed and says, actually, it's just justified under the good of charity. And this idea of sacrificial love is this overriding principle. Germain Grise says it's basically an application of double effect reasoning and that we foresee um, the harm to our own body via live organ donation, but we don't intend it. The only thing we intend is the donation of our organs to someone in great need. I think undergirding all of these different approaches is this distinction between anatomical and functional integrity. So anatomical integrity is the physical, respecting our physical and um, anatom or, or anatomy. So we have a physical body. That's what anatomical integrity is. Functional integrity looks towards the actual functions and capacities of our body. And so in live donor organ donation, when we harvest an organ, we do, don't respect the anatomical integrity of the body, but we do respect the functional integrity of the body because we're not getting rid of our capacity for the kidneys to filter toxins, for instance. Um, that still is there. Now, it might be a little bit diminished, but we have a sufficient um, capacity. So we're respecting the functional integrity in that case, and the anatomical integrity, that's not a, an um, un, inviolable principle. Instead, it's just a general rule of thumb. But there's no consensus as to why uh, we, we should allow live organ donation, but all of these uh, philosophers, Catholic philosophers, Christian philosophers, everyone falls under either one of these camps or another one, and it's universally considered to be not only a justifiable act, but a, a great sacrificial um, act on behalf of the donor. But... There are further ethical considerations when you think about the actual practice, not the concept of live donor organ donation. The living donor must provide voluntary informed consent, and this is especially critical because live, organ, uh, live donor organ donation is especially ripe for coercion. So in, in the general medical practice, let's think about if I, I need chemotherapy, whether I choose to have chemotherapy or choose to deny the chemotherapy, that's not affecting the physical health or life of another person. Um, it, they could gain to uh, um, benefit financially with a very, very meager inheritance, um, but it doesn't actually affect their physical life. And so there could be pressure, but not, not, sufficient, not as sufficient as we have in uh, organ donation. If you think about the organ donation context, think about a woman who has a husband and a son and the husband's in need of a kidney, and the son has a kidney that matches. She might not explicitly coerce the child into providing a kidney or explicitly pressure the child to provide a kidney, but that pressure is probably nonetheless there, and that child's going to feel that pressure of, hey, I'm the only one who can save my dad's life. Um, so it's really incumbent upon medical professionals to ensure those coercive um, forces in this instance are not there. And one of the ways they can do that is by informing uh, the patient of the risks to him or herself and the benefits to the recipient so they, they understand they're making a, a prudent decision. And prudence in this case basically means that the benefits to the recipient are proportionate to the risks to the donor. This is an idea that I believe is layered throughout medicine, this idea of proportionality to ensure we're doing the prudent thing. If the, the recipient has a very poor prognosis irrespective of a new organ and, and the risks to the uh, donor are severe, then it's probably not justified and proportionality is not met. Of course, that doesn't get to the heart of the matter, but it, it is circumstantial and, and it's important that the, the actual donor think about this while making that decision. Now let's get to donation 
after death, but we're going to start with donation after circulatory death. Um, many opponents of brain death as a concept view donation after circulatory death or DCD donation as perhaps the panacea, it, our, our solution to this process. Um, so just laying the definition here in the Uniform Determination of Death Act, circulatory death is the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions. This has been the historical paradigm since the beginning of human medicine or human civilization. And yes, medicine has widely accepted it um, since its advent millennia or centuries ago. And still to this day, it's the primary means by which we declare someone dead. That's why it's number one in, in the UDDA. Um, the heartbeat has a significant cultural um, influence because it represents life. It, it's very, it's a very powerful symbol. Think about the Texas Heartbeat Act. Um, I wear my heart on my sleeve, whatever it might be. Um, the heart in our culture matters quite a bit because it's this recognition that the heart represents life. Heart's no longer beating. If we're no longer breathing, we are dead. That is still the case today. That has not gone, that has not gone away with brain death. But this is proposed as sort of the solution is why don't we wait till the heart stops, wait till the breathing stops. The reason I don't think this really works is because it's nested in its own ethical concerns. And we're going to talk about that now. The first is more of a practical matter, and that is there's pressure to prematurely withdraw treatment. That's the case um, in general at hospitals if, if the facility doesn't think your life is worth living. But that's especially true if there's potential organs on the other end, because organs are a very, very valuable commodity in our country and throughout the world. There's also a problem, perhaps, with the administrative uh, administration of anti-mortem medications to preserve organs. So anti-before uh, medicate or mortem death, so before death medications, so these preserve the organs um, for uh, future donation to a, another recipient. The problem here is, again, it looks like we're treating that patient as a means and not an ends, as we always should. But I think if we're able to justify live organ donation and when we, in which we literally carve into someone and, and take a healthy organ, then I think it's possible to justify giving that person a, a medication to preserve their organs for a later donation. So I don't think this concern holds much water. But this next point does get to the heart of the matter, and that is the dead donor rule. So the dead donor rule recognizes if we're going to donate a vital, um, unpaired organ, so that would be an entire pancreas, for instance, a heart, uh, that organ must come from a dead donor. Because if it comes from a living donor, then the actual harvesting of the organ is going to be the means by which the donor actually dies because they're being deprived of a vital organ. And that would be homicide and to, and to the extent that the death is in, foreseen and the act is intended, it's actually murder. And that would subvert the entire practice of medicine, which is ordered to the flourishing of human beings. So it's important uh, uh, for the pro-life movement, it's incumbent upon us to always respect the dead donor rule. There are people who don't, like Peter Singer, who wants to do away with the dead donor rule, but he doesn't share our first premises. If we respect uh, human life and all innocent human life and value their lives, then we have to respect the dead donor rule and, and make sure that it's not violated in our practices. So when does the patient actually die? Well, if you remember, the definition is the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions. But what is irreversible actually mean? Does it refer to auto resuscitation? So after our heartbeat stops, after our breathing stops, there's a period of time in which that can spontaneously um, come back. It's called auto resuscitation. But even long, even over a longer period of time, it can be brought back artificially with technological interventions. So what does irreversible mean in this context? Does it mean when it can't spontaneously come back or when there's nothing we can do um, with our technological interventions. So that raises the question of, well, as our technological interventions get better, does that mean someone's alive longer? 
after their heart stops and the breathing stops. That doesn't seem to make sense. So there's disagreement about when does a patient actually die technically after the heartbeat and breathing stops. And so there's different protocols with different wait waiting periods. And here are just a few. At one end of the extreme is a, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which says you just need to wait two minutes after the heartbeat stops and breathing stops. And at the other end is uh, Dr. Alan Schumann, who's actually the foremost opponent of brain death today. And he says, wait 20 to 30 minutes. The dilemma enters a picture when we think about the actual organs themselves. We should probably be cautious in determining someone is dead. So that would be that would mean waiting longer, so longer than two minutes, um, perhaps 10 minutes or longer. Well, the longer we wait, the more likely the organs are uh, to not no longer be viable because they start to deteriorate. And so we have, I think, the pro-life forces pushing us to wait longer, but there's these utilitarian forces of, of in need of organs saying, well, we can't wait quite as long because the organ won't be viable anymore. And so those forces are like uh, pushing against each other. And this has not been fully resolved as an issue. And it's why I think uh, uh, donation after circulatory death, right now at least, is not a viable replacement of donation after brain death, which we're going to talk about now. So um, you can see there it's number two, the second uh, point in the Unif um, Uniform Determination of Death Act the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. Um, it's called brain death. You can also call it neurological criteria, so criteria associated with the brain. Text's right to life's position on this is that we're skeptical. Uh, we, we have questions, we have concerns, we have doubts, because we're not convinced of the veracity of brain death as a concept. And I'm going to talk about that in, in future slides. But uh, this now has um, entered the picture in all, uh, all 50 states, as you'll see here. Um, but it arose in the 1960s out of two concerns. The first is that there is an advent of mechanical ventilators sustaining the lives of patients with catastrophic brain injuries, thereby depleting brain or bed space. And so the healthcare industry medical professionals saw that these patients who had previously passed away quickly seemed to be staying alive indefinitely without improving because of mechanical ventilators. Some describe this state as a state beyond coma. They, and, and so they were concerned, like, we need bed space. There are more patients coming in, but we have patients who never leave. And so that was the first concern. And the second concern was a need for organs with the development of organ transplantation. So in 1967, the, the first heart transplantation took place in South Africa. Of course, you can't take a heart from a healthy living patient um, because that would kill them. Uh, and it really can't take a heart from someone who's died um, after circulatory death because if their heart stops, it's likely their heart is already unhealthy at that point and not suitable for transplantation. And we need hearts, so what do we do? Well, here comes a Harvard ad hoc committee which has a solution. And in 1968, they equated irreversible coma, what we know today as brain death, with biological death. And then in 1981, the President's Commission for the Ethical Studies of Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research proposed the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which is what this is here, which has been enacted um, in every state in some form. In Texas, we have not enacted identical legislation. There are some small changes here, but I think that's a distinction without any sort of difference in clinical practice. It'll be interesting to see if that's actually the case. So it'd be a study for uh, a proposal for a future study there. Now, they, uh, a lot of proponents of brain death sort of reject this characteriz characterization of the ad hoc committee and those concerns. And we say, well, organ donation was a preeminent concern to the development of brain death. They say, no, that's not true at all. It just, it was a concern about patients who were dying no longer appearing to be dead and wanting to resolve um, that problem. But why don't we go to the actual source material ourselves? So the document released by the ad hoc committee was called a definition of irreversible coma. And in the first draft, so this was eliminated before the final draft, 
They said, there is a great need for tissues and organs of, among others, the patients whose cerebrum has been hopelessly destroyed in order to restore those who are salvageable. Sounds like uh, organ donation was a, a paramount concern for them at the time. And then we can also go to Henry Beecher, who chaired the ad hoc committee, and who's also a, a famed physician and one of the founders of medical ethics in the United States. Like this, Henry Beecher, is a, he was a big dude in, in, in bioethics. So this is not me uh, nut picking. He said uh, separately that every major hospital has patients stacking up, waiting to be suitable donors. Sounds like organ donation again is a concern. And separately from that, um, in response to people who are critical of the idea of irreversible coma or brain death being death, he said, the curable, the salvageable can thus be sacrificed to the hopelessly damaged and unconscious who consume the time and space and money better devoted to those who could be helped. So he's not talking about brain death though, but is that alternative really any better? So no, brain death wasn't, it's not about organ donation. It, it's more that we have these uh, worthless lives who are exhausting bed space and we need to get them out. It doesn't really sound like a, um, a good faith uh, reason to start changing our understanding of death. So there were really the two concerns both provided perverse incentives, and that's an issue. All right, so how, can, how should we actually conceptualize death overall and think about death? Well, I think we can through three lenses. At the top is sort of a conceptual proposal of what death is. Below that is the anatomical manifestation, so how, how that con concept sort of plays out physiologically. And below that is a clinical testing and protocols we use to determine if those criteria have been met. And it's important that we have a coherent understanding uh, of this entire system, that they must support each other. In that sense, they must be vertically aligned. The clinical tests and protocols must show that anatomical criteria must be met sufficiently. And that anatomical criteria must actually be some sort of ma manifestation of um, the concept we're operating under. If not, then we're being um, logically unsound and there's an issue that we need to resolve. So starting at the top here with our philosophical concepts, let's think about these. So there's a sociological understanding of death. This was brought up a little bit on the podcast. This is the idea that death is not a metaphysical reality. It's not a physical reality. Instead, it's something we create. It's a story we tell ourselves about ourselves, nothing more. Um, but we recognize at some point someone has departed us. And so we have to, just for just to be prudent, we have to draw a line somewhere arbitrarily. And so one of the ways they can do this is a purely sociological means, and that is as a society, we have come together and have chosen this line that demarcates life from death for, for no particular reason other than we decided it was the best line. There's also a pluralistic approach, and that is, um, within certain reasonable parameters that we've established as society, we're going to allow patients to choose their own understanding of death and, and an understanding of death that is no more right or wrong than what someone else may choose. So that's a pluralistic approach that, that is nonetheless sociological. So that's one understanding of death, that death isn't real, we just construct it as society. The second approach is psychological or higher brain death. Um, underpinning this concept is the idea that fundamentally we are not human organisms, but rather we are mind, we are a consciousness, we are a subject of experiences, etc., inhabiting a body. That's what we fundamentally are. We have a human organism that, that lives and dies biologically, but we fundamentally are not a human organism. We're, we're something beyond that. So when we talk about death, we talk about the irreversible loss of consciousness or, or, or certain rational capacities, because fundamentally, we're, we're not an organism, we're a mind, um, we're a consciousness, etc. A biological concept of death says, no, actually, we are fundamentally a human organism. So we die when the organism dies. So how should we think about this? Well, biologically, what is an organism? Essentially, it's it's a living thing that is 
um, greater than the sum of its parts, in a sense, greater than the sum of its con constituent parts that are integrated for the good of the whole. And there's three levels of integration at play. There's somatic integration at the top, which is integration between organs and organ systems working together for the good of the whole. So for instance, for us, it's our, our organs, it's our arms, our brain, heart, lungs, pancreas, kidneys, everything working together, all of our organ systems working together to keep us alive. Below that is um, integration within organs and organ systems. And below that further is just cellular integration. Well, if we think about what we are as organisms, then we die when we lose somatic integration because we're an organism, we're not just a sum of organs and organ systems. Um, and that's because uh, global coordination and integration is characteristic of all organisms and it's characteristic of the human organism. But insofar as all of these other organ systems and organs are interdependent on one another, they soon enter a trajectory towards annihilation as well, and their functioning will soon cease, and then cellular death will soon follow. So that's what biological death actually looks like in practice. We lose cellular or uh, somatic integration, and our body starts to deteriorate everywhere. And below that, the, the cardiorespiratory and neurological criteria, as we've discussed already, those are the two dominant ways that, um, that these concepts um, manifest physically. And then there was clinical testing and protocols about which I'll have more to say in just a second. But first, how should we understand death from a Christian perspective? Um, and I think a philosophically correct perspective as well. Um, well, first we need to lay out a Christian anthropology, what it means to be human in the Christian sense, and then we can understand what death is in the Christian sense. So Christian, Christians and all human beings are hylomorphic composites of body and soul. Uh, that's some philosophical jargon that I'm about to explain. So if we think about this term, it, it means that we're not just a soul that inhabits a body, and we're not just a body that possesses a soul. We are both body and soul at the same time, in the same sense that, this is not a perfect analogy, but I think it's close enough. I am not a legislative associate just a legislative associate. I'm not just a political associate. I'm a legislative and a political associate. I'm not just a father. I'm not just a husband. I'm a father and a husband. I can be both things at the same time. These are not mutually exclusive categories that they can coexist. And that's what we are. Uh, fleshing this out a bit further, we can think, Think of the soul as the animating and integrative principle of the body. So it's animating in layman's terms by giving us life. And then it's integrative in that it holds us together in a sense. And that's called the substantial form, which is a philosophical jargon. But that's what the soul is. It, it enlivens us in a sense. The body is the stuff of which we are physically made. So that's the matter, which is both a philosophical term and a chemistry term, although this is used in the philosophical sense. That makes sense enough. So it's our, our tissues, our cells, et cetera. And in short, we are embodied beings. It's our soul, which is animating and integrating our body. We need both our body and our soul. And death occurs then when the soul departs the body. If we need both, when they're both no longer present, that's the moment of death. So how does this actually manifest biologically? What does that look like? Well, um, and as much as a soul integrates our body, then when it leaves, our body is literally going to disintegrate and start to decompose, which, not coincidentally, um, also marks biological death. So the Christian anthropological understanding of death is biological. And I think that makes sense. In uh, my master's program, I took a faith and reason class. It was sort of our philosophical foundations class. And it was titled Faith and Reason uh, under the idea that our faith is not only not discordant with reason, but they actually reinforce each other. They work with each other. They strengthen each other. Um, God obviously created us, but he created the entire universe and created all of the physical laws that govern the universe, including biology. And so it makes sense that our theology is going to track closely with the biology when it comes to death and everything as well. 
So what's the justification for brain death then? So we have our Christian anthropology, which is biological, and that is at least the formal defense of brain death, um, um, brain death today. Um, that's why it was created. It was understood, at least at the beginning, to be biological death. That's not necessarily the case anymore. In fact, the majority of philosophers and academics and um, medical professionals cite uh, or say they believe that actually uh, brain death is more of a psychological, under the psychological concept of death than the biological concept of death. But I think we should put it under the biological concept here because there are ardent pro-life bioethicists who say brain death is biological death. And so we want to steel man their argument. I think it's important whenever you engage, interact with another position and you challenge another position that you make it the strongest version of itself. And in that sense, it is that brain death is biological death. Because if it's not biological death, then it violates the dead donor rule and we should not accept it as Christians because it, it does not accord with our Christian anthropology. So there are people like Peter Singer, uh, and, and other academics who who don't believe brain death is uh, biological death, but that's not the position of Wesley J. Smith. That's not the position of Father Tad Paholczyk at the National Catholic Bioethics Center. And that's not the position of numerous other pro-life bioethicists. So we want to make their position as strong as possible. So brain death is biological death. So below that, we have neurological criteria, um, i.e. brain death. And then below that are the clinical tests and protocols we use to determine whether brain death occurs, whether the neurological criteria have been met. Um, almost always, um, it includes a physical examination, a bedside examination, for instance, seeing if the patient has certain reflexes. That's accompanied by often an apnea test, and I'll have more to say about that in a second. And there's other ancillary tests that uh, the hospital, the medical professionals can use to, to test for the neurological criteria, uh, an, an electroencephalogram, the EEG, a blood flow test, MRI, et cetera. They, those don't have to be used, but they, they can be used, especially if the hospital is wanting to be a little bit more rigorous than required. But brain death has innumerable uh, concerns here. The first is the existence of chronic brain death patients. So many proponents of brain death, especially in pro-life circles, point and say that, yes, they still look to be alive on a ventilator. It's sort of this enlivened corpse, but the rest of their body is going to deteriorate soon thereafter. But that's not the case. There are many, many documented instances of patients declared brain dead who have lived for years. So that deterioration is not soon following that determination of brain death. And, and, and that gets to the heart of whether brain death is actually legitimate or not. There are also many signs of integration that require the cooperation of many organ systems that are present in patients who are determined to be brain dead. And many homeostatic stability is maintained, so that's keeping uh, a temperature stable and a chemical balance across the body. There's the fighting of infections, the healing of wounds, the gestating of a a baby in pregnancy, the Marlies Munoz case here in Texas is just one example. Maintaining a pregnancy requires the cooperation of more than one organ system. It's not just the reproductive system, it's much more. There's a digestion of food, um, and there's proportionate growth across the entire body. All of these have been documented to be present in patients determined to be brain dead. And remember, if the integration across organ systems are, are, is present, then the patient patient appears to be biologically alive, and that means brain death may not be synonymous with biological death. And there are further concerns yet about brain death. Um, there's an acceptance of hypothalamic functioning when determining brain death. So the hypothalamus regulates metabolic processes and hormones. This sort of functioning can be present, and the patient will still be determined to be brain dead. Um, some have recognized this and has saw that it's a problem and then have redefined our understanding of brain death to be not irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, but the irreversible cessation of all clinical or critical functions of the entire brain. The problem is the hypothalamic functioning is both clinical and critical. It is clinical in the sense that 
you just have to wait, for instance, long enough to see the patient pee. That's it. And you'll know if the hypoth uh, hypothalamus is functioning. It's, and it's also critical because it's more critical than others, uh, other functions that are required to be absent for a patient to be brain dead. Um, a patient can't have pupillary reflexes in their eye. If that's present, then the patient's not considered brain dead. The hypothalamus is much more important than your pupillary responses. So in that sense, it's also a critical function. So um, that uh, redefinition doesn't really work. There's also the inability to exclude brain death mimickers. The most common of these being the global ischemic penumbra, which is when blood flow is too low to support brain function, but sufficient to prevent cellular death, which means there's no infarction in the brain, so it can spontaneously regain function over time. And remember, brain death requires the irreversible cessation of all brain activity. And our current testing and protocols cannot differentiate um, GIP and brain death in most instances. There's also an inconsistency in application of tests and protocols. I know this was discussed a bit on the um, podcast. Some hospitals are much more rigorous than others. They will have longer waiting periods, require more testing. It will require either a neurologist to um, either confirm the uh, determination of death or actually make that determination or diagnosis himself. Others will have residents do this work, have um, unusually and astoundingly short waiting periods and will do the bare minimum to determine whether death has been made. So there's sort of an equal protection case in here and that a patient declared dead in one hospital would not be declared dead in another. That's an issue. The presence of an apnea test is also a profound concern as well. So the apnea test is, is used quite frequently in, in determining brain death, although some have started to recognize its inherent problems. What the apnea test does, is it re they remove the ventilator from a patient and then see the carbon dioxide levels go up. And what the patient's supposed to do is reflexively respond to that rising carbon dioxide um, because in order to get the carbon dioxide out. If the patient does not reflexively respond, that suggests that that patient um, is brain dead. It's, it's a confirmatory test um, to the bedside test. But if the patient does respond, then the patient's not brain dead. The problem is patients, all these patients who are being tested for brain death have catastrophic brain injuries. They are incredibly fragile. In the ICU, any sort of change can affect them deleteriously. And now you're depriving them of much needed oxygen over a period of time. So what the apnea test can do is it can precipitate the very physiological state it's met the test for. So in testing for brain death, you may actually cause someone to become brain dead. That's a problem. And then lastly, there's a difficulty in establishing irreversibility. So one of the things we're supposed to do is identify and exclude um, reversible confounders. Um, for instance, uh, drugs can actually eliminate brain function for a given period of time, but not permanently. And so you have to like get a history of the patient to see has there been drug use, for instance. A traumatic event, like a traumatic car accident, could do the same thing. Could it lead to brain death? Um, yes. Could it uh, not lead to brain death, but to something that appears like brain death? Also yes. That's a concern. And one of the ways you can actually exclude certain confounders is by observation periods, waiting times, but those have been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking as we progress forward. Um, so that's meaning we're actually catching fewer confounding factors. We can also look towards recent cases as, as case studies to, to see how this has played out in practice. So TK started as a minor and uh, her name's not been released, but she was brain dead for over 20 years. So she was brain dead for over 20 years and on, on a ventilator that entire time. She was cared for at home. She overcame infections. She underwent puberty. Puberty is a very complex process that, again, requires a cooperation of multiple organ systems. How can someone who's biologically dead be able to do such a thing is a mystery to me. So hi, McMath. Um, she was talked about on the podcast as well. She was from California and, and was had a catastrophic brain injury and was declared brain dead there. Her family was able to transfer her to New Jersey where there's a religious exemption to being declared by brain dead. So she was dead in California, alive in New Jersey by statute. 
She was brain dead for four and a half years. And during that time, she was apparently healthier than many patients in the ICU who are universally considered to be alive. And at, and at certain points, it even looked like she was improving. Someone who's um, brain dead, who has irreversible cessation of brain activity, should not be able to improve over time, by definition. And many have looked at her case, and some have concluded that she potentially had global ischemic penumbra, so that it, um, that it was not able to eliminate that confounding factor and that's why she was determined to be brain dead, even though it looked like she wasn't. Zach Dunlap is another example, and his, his situation is much more acute. He was diagnosed as brain dead only 36 hours after a traumatic car accident. So not even waiting to see if, if there's some other um, confounding factor, like, I don't know, trauma that, that can cause the brain to lose function for a period of time. And not too long before he was going to... Uh, uh, have his organs harvested, he started to move. And they're like, oh, brain dead patients don't uh, move like that. And um, so he woke up and in response to stimuli, and he ended up waking five days later after they uh, first saw that movement. And he's completely healthy today. He's a completely normal, healthy person. And he was diagnosed, of brain, uh, diagnosed as brain dead. And so what I suggest here is that there's a vertical misalignment. Um, I talk about the importance of a vertical alignment um, between the concepts, the, uh, the criteria, and the actual testing. We have to have a coherent alignment between those three things. I don't think that exists because the historical cases and current testing protocols, even when they're applied scrupulously, appear not to indicate biological death, as we can see in um, some of the examples there at least in not all cases. So there are sort of two explanations for this. The first are that the tests and protocols are not um, scrupulous enough, they're not rigorous enough, they're insufficient, and so we need to refine them. We need to make um, the tests more accurate, we need to ensure there are longer waiting periods, we need to ensure we do a better job eliminating cer certain confounding factors over time. And in that situation, this alignment between the tests here at the bottom and the concept of biological death at the top is a problem with the tests here. The tests are bad, the protocols are bad. So we need to bring that over with more rigorous testing, more accurate testing, longer waiting periods. That's one explanation. But perhaps Occam's razor suggests that this second point is more accurate. And that is the biological, that biological death cannot be determined via neurological criteria. That brain death is real. It's a real, it's a it's a real condition. There is a situation in which your brain has no activity, has no function across the entire brain. That exists, but that does not mean you're biologically dead. You, as a human organism, continue to um, live on. Now, that's a catastrophic brain injury. In most circumstances, you won't live on for long, but you can. Our bodies are complex. We don't, in the grand scheme of things, we still don't know that much about them. And so in that situation, what we have here is the biological uh, understanding of death at the top, the tests, and protocols on here, but what's really warped aren't the tests and protocols. It's brain death right here. That's the issue. And so that gets the heart of brain death itself. And that means if this explanation is correct, that means brain death is not synonymous with biological death, which means every time we harvest organs from someone declared brain dead, we in that instance are violating the dead donor rule. And we're killing that patient by extracting their organs. That's the implication of um, that uh, explanation. And so that requires very serious um, inf uh, reflection and require us to uh, change our laws and practices across the country. There's also a third explanation as well. And this is from Melissa Michello. She is a philosopher at the Catholic University of America, and she recognizes these concerns. She acknowledges the problems inherent um, with brain death today and that it looks like integration is still present across organ systems. And so she differentiates between internal and ec the external principle of integration. So she's Catholic. She recognizes that in the internal integration um, is caused by the soul. But when the soul departs the body, some external source of integration can start to replace the soul's work. And that source of external integration she proposes is the mechanical ventilator. So, insofar as the soul has left, the patient has died. 
but integration continues because of this external um, source of integration. The mechanical ventilator has replaced the work of the soul. Sort of um, on the pre-rational a priori level, I, I reflexively um, react negatively to that proposal. The reason being, I don't like the idea that we can compare the mechanical ventilator to the soul. Although I would say this proposal merits further exploration, instinctively, I, 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 I don't like it. I don't, I don't think it works. Um, the other two explanations work much better. And there are many people who fall explicitly into that second camp. Um, we're not necessarily, again, brain death opponents. We're brain death skeptics. And so, yeah, it very, it very much could be possible that biological death um, does not include brain death. What about a new proposal? Um, this comes from Nicanor Ostriaco. He, he's a priest biologist and bioethicist. And he thinks we should think about um, human organisms as a, a system, basically, a system of organ systems and organs and tissues and cells all working together for the good of the whole. And so we should think of death from this system's perspective. And so that metaphysically, um, theologically, the immaterial soul is the principle of integration. It's what's holding our body together and allowing all of our organ systems to cooperate. Biologically, this does not manifest in any single organ, i.e., the brain or heart. So it's not like our the soul, when it's working, it works through the brain or works through the heart. It doesn't work through a single organ. Instead, multiple organ systems contribute to the functional unity of the body. It's all of our organ systems, all of our organs working together. The brain manifests in all of them. The way this was put by uh, in 2008 by the President's Commission on Bioethics is that integration is an emergent property of the entire organism not just the brain, not just the heart, et cetera. And so that means is all, all of our organs are important. Yes, the brain's an incredibly important organ. No one will deny that. But is it the, mo is it the most important organ? Perhaps, but is, is it so critical that we can't live without it? From the system's perspective, probably not. It'll make it much more difficult to live. And of course, people who are diagnosed as brain death do, in some circumstances, deteriorate very quickly. In fact, in most circumstances, but not always because the human body is a very complex set of systems that are all important to our overall functioning. And so in, in this uh, proposal, death occurs when the entire body, again, disintegrates because the soul has left and we lose integration. And that will be sometimes sometime following the loss of brain function and cardiorespiratory support. So even though we're not breathing, in, even though we don't have a heartbeat, theoretically, we're still alive for a period of time. After we lose brain function, we're still alive for a period of time. But sometimes, sometime after we lose both of those things, we, we will die. The exact timeline would need to be worked out. Um, this is just his proposal. Um, but this is another way to, th to think about death. Okay, so that's the... The end of the discussion on brain death. So just one last slide here about organ donation. Should you be an organ donor? A living donor, I think, uh, absolutely, if the circumstances call for it. It's a courageous act of charity. Um, caritas or agape, that sacrificial form of love, making the good of another one's own. Um, it's the highest form of love. And if, if we're called to that because of certain circumstances, I think we should accept that call. We may not be able to, for other circumstantial reasons, but if we can, then we should, um, because we're called to love as Christ loved us. Um, should you be a dead donor? Well, if you still think the answer is yes, you need to leave because you've not paid attention to anything I've said. Um, but, uh, but honestly, um, given the controversy and uncertainty surrounding brain death, this seems imprudent. Uh, if we don't know if a brain death person is actually dead, we could be violating the dead donor rule on a mass scale. And you don't want to be subject to that one day being killed by having your organs harvested from you. It does not mean you're ever going to fully recover. It does not ever mean, it does not necessarily mean you're going to regain consciousness. Although like Zach Dunlap, you might, 
Um, what what it means though is we need to respect your body and respect your life and whatever whatever form it is. Our lives are invi- inviolable. They're important, even in their most diminished form. And so, if you are currently a registered organ donation or organ donor, you can go to donatelifetexas.org and enter in your license information to log on and remove yourself from the registry. And next time you update your license or um, yeah, update your license, you can get the heart removed from your license by just not accepting to be an organ donor. In fact, if you want to, you can do that immediately by ordering a new license as well. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Miranda Miranda asks whether, um, what does Texas's uh, definition of death actually say and what's different from the UDDA? So the UDDA says irreversible cessation of all um, uh, functioning of the entire brain, including the brain stem. I think the key word in ours that distinguishes ours is the word relevant that's weirdly put in there. Again, it's an idiosyncratic um, construction. It's possible someone can interpret that to mean like, well, you know, I don't think, you know, the ability to talk is all that relevant. So this person's brain dead and therefore dead. I don't think that that's actually how it plays out in practice, though. So I, I, I doubt it's significant in the clinical context, but there are some differences, and I think that's a major difference. So Kim's asking, what does Peter Singer believe? Why, why, what does he think death is? Why does he subscribe to the psychological concept of death? And, and why does he think we can violate the dead donor rule? So Peter Singer believes, um, he believes that fundamentally what we are is an entity with rational preferences. And someone who is permanently unconscious and um, not expected to regain any rational capacities is not an entity with um, rational preferences. And so in that sense, he has a, a psychological-based understanding of human identity um, compared to our biological understanding of human identity. So that's his concept of death. And in regards to the dead donor rule, that means he thinks if you're biologically alive, as he thinks brain dead patients are when they're on a ventilator, he believes they are biologically alive. That is his position. He thinks we can still take their organs. In fact, he'd go a step farther. And I suspect he would say that even if a patient was psychologically alive in the sense that you or I are, and, and still like maintain their biographical capacities, if they wanted to choose to donate their organs, I don't think um, he'd be too concerned with it. He'd be like, because he supports euthanasia, for instance, he just want to probably put in some procedural safeguards. But if that decision was fully informed, I don't think he'd object to it. So that's why he does not agree with the dead donor rule. John asks, is there any circumstances in which we can licitly violate the dead donor rule, as in someone is sacrificing their life for someone else, so let's say a a mother sacrificing her life for her child. Um, no, and the reason is, is that the harvesting of the organ, the harvesting of the heart in that circumstance will be the efficient primary cause of our death. And we can never be the efficient primary cause of an innocent person's death, uh, including our own. Now, with someone sacrificing their life, it's very possible they're a partial cause of their own death, but really what is killing them is the actions of someone else. So that's how you distinguish um, that circumstance is when someone's sacrificing their life, it's typically because of some heinous or malicious thing someone else is doing and you're like willingly accepting your fate to save someone else's. Whereas in the context of live organ donation, um, it's not someone else's actions. It, it could be, I guess, the technician's actions, but you're, um, you're facilitating it. You've, you've asked them to do it. It's your own actions that are causing your own death. And that's what's wrong about it. Does that make sense? Um, so Ga- Gabriel asks, uh, there's there's a scarcity of organs. And if we can't take organs because of brain death, brain death potentially being wrong, and the, the, the problems within the uh, donation after circulatory death, what do we do? Is, is there any sort of solution that we can have? Or is this something we have to live with because of the fall? Is that... Yeah. So I think we're going to solve this problem. And, and there's sort of two avenues. The first is uh, xenotransplantation. So that would be transplantation from an animal. And the second would be artificially constructed organs. 
And there are scientists working on both solutions within the you know, transplantation realm. What some have done is turn off certain um, genes within a pig to make a pig's organs more compatible with that of a human. And you can take that pig's organ, like a, a pig, genetically a pig organ, and put it into a human being and have that organ work. It's scary, but if you're about to die, that might be a risk you're willing to take. And the other thing they can do is instead, actually at the embryonic level, is um, put human stem cells into the pig and have it and program those to turn into a human organ within the pig and then take that human organ from the pig later on. That would be a, another instance um, or another situation that could help. The, the primary principle there is do not touch the brain. You do not want to start interfering with a pig's rational abilities and start giving them human-like uh, human intelligence. So that would have to strictly um, be confined to other organs. But if so, and assuming the stem cells that, that we utilize are, are not harvested um, from embryos, that they're, they're adult stem cells or they're induced pluripotent stem cells, then there shouldn't be an issue. And then with artificial organs, it's just that. It's actually constructing something, uh, a technical instrument that will perform the same duties as our, our, our organs that we have. Um, we're not there yet. The science is not there yet, but we're rapidly, rapidly approaching um, that ability. And so that would be something that can solve the problem of organ scarcity. So the religious exemption, I think it would be important to say that religious or conscientious exemptions are based on skepticism and, and not pluralism. So it would not be the recognition that if you're Jewish or you're Christian, you die at a different time than when someone who isn't Jewish or Christian dies. Um, I think that that runs into problems in that we're undermining our own Christian anthropology by accepting that premise. And we also open that, that sort of debate up on the front door. Do we, do we all start lives at different times? Um, that's not helpful for the abortion debate. But if we frame that, and I need to repeat your question too. Okay. Um, but if we frame the uh, issue in terms of moral skepticism in that we don't really know when someone dies, so we're going to allow people to opt out of brain death because we want to allow people to be cautious, I think that's a, that's a perfectly valid approach. And so... Kim's question um, that she repeated from um, the ether is that what's the uh, what's one way we can actually amend the UDDA? Could we approach it with some sort of conscientious or religious exception? And that was my or exemption. And that was my uh, answer. So Irma asked, "Can an older person donate their organs? Is, is there a limit to that person's age?" Um, Theoretically, no, if that person just had fantastically healthy organs. But our, our organs, their functioning starts to get a little bit worse as we age. And, and, and that's not to bash on old people, because guess what? We always get old. Everyone gets old. So you make fun of old people now, you'll be old too one day, and people will make fun of you. So it's uh, it all comes around. <laughs> and so with... with with the actual donation of organs, um, they take that into account. And if, if, and if you're older, it's less likely they will harvest your organs because they're not just looking for organs, they're looking for healthy organs that are suitable for a recipient. Yes, George asks if, if the entire country listened to my presentation and uh, that wouldn't happen. I don't know who would want to do that. Um, but if the entire country listened to my presentation and everyone stopped um, being a registered organ donor, what, what would we tell patients um, who, who need organs? Like how, how could we be sympathetic to their concerns and, and their needs when, when we have this potential solution that, that to which we're saying no? Well, after the angry mob left my house, um, I would probably start by saying, well, we need to invest in artificial organs and, and xenotransplantation to the extent that we can make those practices ethical, that we need to redouble our efforts and, and to solving the diseases and injuries 
illnesses that, that occur that cause these patients to, to have organs that no longer function or that are rapidly deteriorating. And to let them know that, like, yeah, we, we are all going to die. And what we need to do is an invest in, in ethical medicine that doesn't objectify others, that doesn't hurt others just to help some people. And so we're going to walk with them and we're going to do our best to treat their diseases that they have. And we're going to invest in medicine that can help them and into the, the artificial um, organs and xenotransplantation as a solution. But um, this life sucks sometimes, but we always have to be compassionate. We always have to be understanding and we have to listen to. It's not just about talking. It's often about listening to their concerns. And then sticking to your convictions, but re responding in a, in a manner that is comprehensible, but also um, sy sympathetic and always with charity. Thank you, everyone.